Stanford University, uh, who will be talking to us about uh, truncated uh, sphere spectra. So the title of this talk is Truncated Sphere Spectrum uh, in Homological Algebra. Uh, so if at any point anyone wishes to ask a question, just unmute yourself. Um, or if you're shy, uh, you, can, you can ask the question in the chat and then Carlos and I can ask it for you. Uh, there will be a questions round at the end of the talk. So yeah, well, please go ahead, Nick. Thank you very much. All right, well, thank you very much for the, uh, the invitation. Let me get this, here we go. There we are, okay. Um, yeah, so I wanted to talk about some um, kind of category theory and stable homotopy theory and uh, homological algebra, categorified homological algebra, um, stuff that I've been thinking about for uh, quite a long time now. Um, oh, I have to actually, there we go. Um, so uh, Kapranov wrote this, I think it appeared as a, a chapter in a, in a book, and a, you can find it on the archive, a, a little expositional paper called Supergeometry in Mathematics and Physics. And he wanted to talk about uh, four different things. So there was supersymmetry in the kind of physics sense of the, of the word. Um, there is supergeometry in the kind of purely mathematical sense. Um, there was uh, how you know these things have something to do with the sphere spectrum in stable homotopy theory. And then the kind of categorical part of this was the, the study of um, Picard N categories. Um, and his idea for you know why these things are all kind of linked together was that um, each of them use at some level uh, this sort of Kazool sign rule from algebra, which is that if you've got a um, if you've got like a, a graded algebra and you want to permute two two elements past each other, so instead of thinking of a times b, you want to th think about b times a. Um, you shouldn't just you know swap them. It's not it's not a a reasonable kind of reasonably applicable theory. Maybe I should say. Uh, to just to just swap them and call that a, a good notion of commutativity, but you need to introduce kind of an appropriate number of minus signs, and this is a this is a common phenomenon seen in in all kinds of uh, kind of graded algebra. Um, and Kapranov's idea was that somehow all four of these topics uh, had this had this sign rule um, somewhere embedded inside them. Um, so I want to try to, you know, talk about the structures going on behind some of these things, and in particular, um, move toward telling you what what a kind of two categorical Kazool sign rule might look like, and why um, why you should think that it comes from the the two truncation of the sphere spectrum. Um, so this is joint work uh, with some people. So I've written lots of papers with uh, Niles Johnson and Angelica Asorno um, on on these topics, and I won't kind of pick out like which thing comes from from which paper. Um, and then the three of us also wrote a paper with Mark Stefan um, a few years ago, uh, which I think really kind of solidified for me some of the places where the, um, the, the two-dimensional theory that I'm gonna talk about or get to talking about towards the end is actually like much harder than the one-dimensional version. And furthermore, why the, uh, the three-dimensional version is gonna be kind of an even further step up in difficulty. So here's the, here's the plan for the talk. So I'm gonna talk about kind of the category theory first um, and then the homotopy theory second and then the two things together. So I'm gonna start by talking about just Picard categories and Picard two categories. Um, then, yeah, we'll just talk about some, some things that you meet when you do very specific things in stable homotopy theory that are relevant for what we're talking about today. Um, the specific one that 
uh, is going to kind of make a strong algebraic appearance is this notion of a K invariant. Um, so we'll talk about K invariants kind of in the world of Picard categories, and then we'll get to this, uh, this like higher dimensional sign rule kind of stuff at the end. Okay. So here's the definition. Um, a Picard category uh, is a symmetric monoidal groupoid in which every object is invertible. So you've got uh, you've got your oh no I need a I need an actual there we go an actual color. So you've got your uh, your groupoid M um, and. It's got uh, a monoidal structure, a symmetric monoidal structure. Um, and then we, we need that all of the objects are invertible. So this just means for all, say, M in M, there exists an N in M such that M tensor N is isomorphic to the unit object. Um, maybe I should have already uh, chosen a different a different symbol. So I'll just uh, for now I'll call this I. Um, I want to really think about these as being categorified versions of abelian groups. So um, I often you know might even use just like a, a direct sum symbol instead of a tensor product symbol for the monoidal structure, and then I'll use zero as the uh, as the, the unit object. Um, so really, uh, you know, this, this definition kind of comes in two parts, symmetric monoidal groupoid, every object is invertible. Um, but that's, that's kind of not really uh, the, way, the way that you should think about what's going on here. Um, the, the invertibility part, for both the morphisms and the objects, that should be seen as like the fact that we're dealing with spaces and homotopies uh, in in topological spaces are always invertible. And then the the monoidal structure, really symmetric monoidal structure, that's the thing that um, that tells you that you're supposed to be doing uh, stable homotopy theory as opposed to ordinary homotopy theory. This doesn't make a you know an impact in kind of how you prove a theorem, um, but it's just it's just the way that I kind of naturally see the the different pieces of the definition fitting together. All the invertibility is kind of one part, even though objects being invertible doesn't make sense before you've got the monoidal structure, and then the symmetric monoidal structure is another another feature. Okay, so classic examples are like if you fix a space then you can look at line bundles over that space and you can look at the, the bundle tensor product. Um, this is, the, this is the, the classical origin of the, the word Picard in this case. So this is you know, where like the Picard group of a ring uh, fits, fits naturally into, um, into this, kind of, this kind of formalism. Um, you can take any symmetric monoidal category you want and you can form a thing that I'll, I'll write as pick M, which, which is just all of the invertible things inside of M. So we take all of the objects of M that are invertible under the tensor product, and then we take all of the isomorphisms between those. And that's, that's gonna be uh, obviously a Picard category. This is like the group of units of a ring, except now we're doing it for symmetric monoidal categories. Um, if you take a pair of abelian groups, uh, we figured out a way to make a thing that that we called Tor of A comma B, which which sort of has as objects uh, things that look like elements of the tensor product, and as morphisms things that look like elements of uh, Tor one of A comma B. Um, it doesn't come out, you know, quite so quite so straightforwardly is that, um, but this was, this was a nice little fun example to play with. Um, and then finally, if you've got a spectrum X, and I'll talk more about spectra in the second part, then you can take um, the fundamental groupoid of X. 
this this really means that what you have to do is you have to take um, you have to take your spectrum X and then you know X is not a single space it's a uh, it's a sequence of spaces so you really need to take the zero space and so that's an an actual uh, honest to God space at this point and so we can take the fundamental groupoid of that space and that'll be a groupoid and then the fact that um, X zero is the zero space of a spectrum is what gives you the um, the symmetric monoidal structure and the invertibility of the objects. Now, from these, um, we can extract sort of two obvious homotopy groups, um, pi zero and pi one. So pi zero is going to just be the um, the isomorphism classes of objects. Since it's a symmetric monoidal category, then that'll inherit a commutative monoid structure. And then the fact that every object's invertible means it's an abelian group. Um, and then pi one is going to be the set of automorphisms of the unit object. And in any uh, monoidal category, the automorphisms of the unit object form, a, um, form an abelian group. Um, so the pi one like clearly has a sort of base point built into it, which is to say the unit object. But um, you can you can translate that anywhere you like because every object is invertible. So tensoring with a fixed object is an auto equivalence of the whole category. And so that means if you wanted to do pi one based at a at another object, then you would you would get an isomorphic um, an isomorphic abelian group. So. Um, Here's a kind of uh, thing that I would call like a coherence theorem that tells you a lot of things that you might try to understand are all the same, um, proven kind of in in various uh, pieces and parts by uh, myself and Kapranov and uh, Niles and Angelica. And I like to state it this way that uh, the following four Picard categories are equivalent as symmetric monoidal categories. So there's the first one, which is the free Picard category generated by a single object. Um, you can write down a kind of monadic description of Picard categories. And once you've done that, then you know you have to have free algebras on something. And so you can take uh, a single a single object and and generate a free thing on that. Um, you can also do this in two pieces. That's that's number two. So that's take your single object generate a free symmetric monoidal category on that and then kind of freely invert all the objects. Um, and this is uh, this is just a sort of instance of, you know, if you've got a composite of two left adjoints, it's the, the left adjoint of the composite of the right adjoints sort of situation. Um, then there's the fundamental groupoid of the sphere spectrum. Um, so you take the sphere spectrum which is central in stable homotopy theory, you take its zero space, which um, is not a thing that you can easily kind of write down and just say, yeah, I, I know exactly what I'm, I'm talking about on, on a sort of space level. Um, it's a complicated space. Uh, and then you can take the fundamental groupoid on that. Or um, you can take the symmetric monoidal category of graded abelian groups, and you can do this pick construction. So you take all the invertible graded abelian groups under the graded tensor product, and then all of the isomorphisms between those. And the claim is that all of these are, um, are equivalent as symmetric monoidal categories. So, you know, one and two are kind of the category theory components. Number three is the, um, is the sort of stable homotopy theory and topology part. And number four is, uh, is the kind of purely algebraic description um, of these. And um, an interesting thing is that this, this gives you a sort of universal minus one for invertible objects in symmetric monoidal categories. So I wanna say something about that before we go on, because really like the, the existence of these, these uh, minus signs is kind of, kind of where this project started. Um, so, so minus one, first and foremost is a map and not an element. Um, so in an, in an abelian group, there's no element called minus one in general, but there is a map from A to A, which sends a little a to minus a. So it's the map that gives you the inverse. 
And so um, in a symmetric monoidal category, if you've got an invertible object, then you can you can make an, a map from that object to itself that's the analog of this of this minus one. So I'll draw it in uh, in string diagrams and then kind of leave it to you to uh, to figure out what's going on. So I've got my my object X and it's invertible. So I can I can add on an an X inverse and an X. So this is just this straight line on the left is uh, is just the identity morphism on X. Um, then I can do the symmetry. And then I can cap that off. And so this, this is a map from X to X. And this is the thing that gives you a sort of uh, a map that you should think of as like minus one. So this is this is the this is the analog of minus one, but in a in a kind of completely general sense for an invertible object in a um, an arbitrary symmetric monoidal category. Now this is not the only way you can draw this. Um, this this coherence theorem that I stated actually tells you that if you want to um, if you want to draw like a minus one, as long as your diagram starts with an x at the top and ends with an X at the bottom um, and has an odd number of crossings, then, then it's the right thing. Um, so you like put in some, some X inverses, you do a permutation and then you cancel a bunch of things and you end up back at X. As long as you did a, a, an odd permutation, then um, you'll get the, the same map. So this is our, this is our minus one. Uh, Nick, I'm sorry. Uh... Yeah? So you can you can draw this diagram in a in something more general like a symmetric nodal rigid category. Yeah. And then you would get a minus one. What what does the minus one map look in that case? Or that's, does it say anything? Or that's a great question, and I have no idea. Okay. Um, so I mean these these are these this kind of diagram does show up in lots of. Um, Lots of sort of like TQFT kinds of computations, but um, yeah, it's it's definitely beyond what I understand of uh, of how those work. So okay. I, I mean, I would I would love to know if you if you find out at some point. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Sure. Okay, so let me tell you about the two dimensional version by putting twos in front of everything. Um, so this is going to be a symmetric monoidal two groupoid in which every object is invertible. And I should, and I think about this in the same way. I think about having like a two category or maybe a bi category. I'm not gonna worry if what the difference between two and bi is. I don't wanna get into those details here. Um, and the invertibility is the kind of stable homotopy part. And I think of the invertibility for the, the objects, the one cells and the two cells as all coming as like one package. And then there's this symmetric monoidal structure. Um, as a as a kind of other other thing. Now, here are analogs of all of the examples I gave for Picard one categories, except that I don't actually really know how to construct most of these. Um, you know, there, it doesn't seem like there's any obstruction to to thinking about like uh, invertible stacks over a, a fixed space instead of instead of uh, invertible uh, sheaves. So but I don't, I don't know anything about what that looks like, and I, I haven't, haven't really looked into it. Um, the second one, where you just take all of the invertible objects, one cells and two cells, inside your favorite symmetric monoidal two category, that one, uh, there's, there's no, there's no sort of modification needed. Um, the Tor example, I think, uh, probably could be, could be generalized. I've just never been sort of interested in, in making it function. Um, and then this, uh, this last one, where if you take a spectrum and you look at its zero space and then you take the fundamental two groupoid, that one I do know uh, how, to, how to deal with that one. Um, Niles and Helica and I worked out pretty explicitly in, um, in some of our papers. And it, it was shockingly like really a lot more work than I was um, expecting it to be. 
but that one works just fine. So some questions um, that you might ask that I will not really answer, but maybe like give you some ideas about. Um, so one would be like, what would a what would a coherence theorem for Picard two categories say? My coherence theorem for Picard one categories had four different things that were all um, equivalent, and we would like to be able to have analogs of those. And I'll tell you a little bit about uh, an answer to that towards the end. Um, a second question might be, how do I just build these things? Um, this this is a difficult question to answer, and um, there have been, you know, a number of uh, kind of mistaken constructions of some of these things. And uh, interestingly enough, the thing that people usually make a mistake on is um, is actually just making a symmetric monoidal thing at all, or maybe even making a braided monoidal thing at all. Um, usually, is the is the part where your construction um, might fall apart. And then the third question is, you know, what algebraic invariants can we uh, can we come up with? And can, do they have some interesting kind of categorical or topological interpretations? I'll, I'll definitely say some about that. And that that's going to be this um, sort of story of K invariants. OK, so uh, this is going to be a quick tour of just the pieces of stable homotopy theory that, that I want to talk about today. So we need to remember the definition of a spectrum. So a spectrum E is a, a sequence of base spaces. So I'll take mine to be indexed by the natural numbers together with um, homotopy equivalences between EI and the loop space of EI plus one. So um, this, is, this is what people mean when they say uh, that we're de-looping um, so we're expressing something as loops of something else. So E i plus one d loops E i because E i is loops on E i plus one. So this this d looping um, definition is not the only way that you could uh, that you could approach this this kind of very basic definition. Furthermore, I should just go ahead and say that the the spectrum definition that I've given here is not even the only one you might come up with. There, there are a lot of um, variants of this definition. You could change homotopy equivalences to homeomorphisms. You could have it be a weak homotopy equivalence. You could have it just be a continuous map. You could do things on the suspension side. There really are a lot of a lot of possibilities. And at some point, you have to invoke. Um, some some kind of abstract homotopy theory and say that those are all the same. But depending on the construction that you want to do, you might choose one of those things as the, the kind of most interesting one to work with. Um, and then the other ways that you might think about these things uh, would be in terms of um, operad actions on spaces. So these are called E infinity spaces. All of the example spectra that we're going to see today um, are what are called connective spectra, which just means that they have no homotopy, no non-zero homotopy groups in negative degrees. So a spectrum has a homotopy group uh, for every integer, um, but the ones that we're going to get only only stop at zero, and they they don't have anything below that. So you can think about these things as um, what are called E infinity spaces. Um, or you can you can study these as uh, what are called gamma spaces. So this is like a, a sort of slightly different um, diagrammatic approach to um, to spectra that uh, has a, has a lot of benefits depending on the kind of um, the kind of constructions you want to make. So this is the basic um, the basic object. Some examples uh, you can have for every abelian group A, you get an Eilenberg MacLean spectrum, uh, which is written HA. And then um, if you want to know the spaces, then HA sort of in uh, space degree I, this is just this is just your favorite Eilenberg MacLean space KAI. So this is a space whose ith homotopy group is A, 
and all of whose other homotopy groups are zero. And there are plenty of ways that you can um, construct these even functorially. There are uh, K-theory and cobordism spectra um, that, that kind of embody K-theory and cobordism as uh, homology and cohomology theories, um, either on the kind of algebraic or the topological side. Um, and, you know, if you've got interest in kind of recent advances in stable homotopy theory, then this this whole field of elliptic cohomology and topological modular forms. And so there's this, this spectrum TMF that kind of glues all these, um, all these things together. Now, what, what spectra do is they give you cohomology theories. So if you, if you take your, uh, your favorite spectrum E, then there's an E cohomology theory. And if you take a space, and you want to figure out the ith e cohomology group, then you look at homotopy classes of maps from X into EI. Um, and this satisfies all of the eilenberg steenrod axioms for cohomology of spaces, except the dimension axiom. Um, this is the dimension axiom, you know, if and only if your spectrum E is, uh, is equivalent to an eilenberg maclean um, In the category of spectra, uh, you still have the suspension and, and loop kind of functors, um, but, but now they're up to homotopy inverses of each other. So in the category of spaces, if you um, suspend a space and then loop it, you don't get back the space that you started with or, or the other way around. You don't get back the space you started with, but in spectra, you do up to um, up to homotopy because these these operations get identified with actually just like shifting your whole spectrum up and down and that's just like a re-indexing and so this feels very much like homological algebra where you can take a chain complex and you can shift it up or down um, so you can even you can even think that the category of spectra is really um, the thing you get by starting with spaces and you've got this endo functor which is the suspension endo functor of spaces. And you could say, well, what if I want to sort of universally make this uh, an, like an, an auto equivalence of my category? Um, that's another, another way that you can construct the category of spectra. Um, now, the, the sort of usual calculations in ordinary homotopy theory carry over here. So in the category of spaces, the, the sphere Sn, as long as n is greater than one, is an abelian co-group object up to homotopy. Um, fundamentally, this is just the same as saying that pi n is an abelian group um, for n greater than one. Um, and co-group objects, like the whole, the whole purpose of being a co-group object is that if you map out of a co-group object into something else, then you get a group. So this means that the, the n-fold loop space, which is maps from Sn into X, um, that that thing becomes an abelian group object. And then homotopy classes of maps from A into the n-fold loops on, on any X, that be also becomes an abelian group. But now we're doing homotopy classes of maps. So we don't have to do up to homotopy anymore. This is just actual homotopy classes of maps. Since the, the, the loop functor is, um, is an auto equivalence, this means that uh, in the category of spectra, the, or the homotopy category of spectra really at this point, um, maps from A to B is isomorphic to maps from loop N A to loop N B because loop is uh, an isomorphism on the, the HOM sets in the homotopy category. But now, since as long as you've got loop n in the target, you always get an additive structure. And so what this means is the, ca the category of spectra um, is, is an abelian group uh, enriched category. So you've got, you've got some like further additivity 
in the category of spectra that you didn't have in the category of spaces. This is another way that you can think that maybe the category of spectra is a useful thing that you can just add arbitrary maps together. So if you want to make some spectra, one or even spaces, one way you can do it um, is what's with what's called a, a Posnikov tower. So a Posnikov tower is a thing that looks like this. Um, so X, X is going to be like way up here and it's going to be, uh, the limit of the, the X eyes that's in the middle. Um, and so the idea is that, uh, X, X N has all of the correct homotopical information from zero up to N. So X zero is, is just knows about the um, the path components of X. And then X1 also knows about the, um, the fundamental group. X2 knows about all the pi twos. And then these, um, these other maps uh, are, are the things that tell you how to attach, um, how to attach the next layer of information. So I've written this out in the, um, in the kind of spectrum notation. So that's what this H is. H means the eilenberg maclean spectrum of the group in it. And then the, the sigmas just mean like where you should shift up or down. So this sigma 2 H of pi 1 of X says that we need to put, uh, we need to make a spectrum whose only homotopy group is the same as pi 1 of the original X, but I want to put it in degree 2. And then I have a map called the, uh, the zeroth K invariant from X zero into that. And that map tells me somehow how to attach pi one of X in the correct dimension to, to X zero. Then um, we've got these, these maps on the left, I one and I two. And so these are, uh, these are some like, kernels um, that tell you that if I um, that if I go the like this way that the kernel of the map from x1 to x0 is the entirety of this pi 1 in degree 1. So that's what the sigma 1 h of pi 1 x is supposed to do. Okay, so this is like a kind of complicated machinery. Um, it lets you do a lot of nice things with some, um, with some like obstruction theory. Uh, we're not going to get too far into it. I just want to give you the idea of, of what this Posnikov tower is supposed to look like. And we're going to see these, these K invariants in a purely algebraic form, um, later on. And it, also it'll look much simpler then, but this is, this is what it looks like if you do it in spaces or spectra. Okay. So how do you like move between. Um, the, the categorical things we're interested in, namely Picard categories, and the topological things, which are spectra. And that's this method of you take a, um, a Picard category and you can take its geometric realization. And that thing uh, is a space. And if you start with a Picard category, then that's the zero space of, um, of an essentially unique spectrum the essentially part is we have a, a, a few restrictions on what spectra we're interested in. Um, and um, that spectrum only has non-zero homotopy groups in dimension zero and one. And if you move up to Picard two categories, you can also take the geometric realization of a two category. And that's gonna now be the zero space of a, of a spectrum. And it's gonna be a spectrum with non-zero homotopy groups in dimensions zero, one, and two. So thinking about the kind of Picard category structure and the homotopy groups on this spectrum um, is one of the main things I want to do in the rest of this talk. So the stable homotopy hypothesis is the stable version of, um, of the ordinary homotopy hypothesis, which is that uh, weak end groupoids are supposed to model homotopy n types. And so now we're saying um, weak end groupoids get replaced with Picard n categories and 
homotopy n types get replaced with stable homotopy n types. So those are going to be spectra, and they're only going to have non-zero homotopy groups in dimension 0, 1, 2, uh, going up to n. So this is a, a kind of organizing principle for how we should think about these structures. And the theorem basically says that the stable homotopy hypothesis uh, is true for n equals 1 for the first part and 2 for the second part. Now, before we leave uh, the kind of the world of, um, of stable homotopy theory, I want to just tell you this slightly complicated uh, little lemma that's going to be useful later, which basically just allows you to understand if the, the spectrum that you found is the two truncation of the sphere spectrum. And so basically what it says is there's some amount of data that you need. And once you've gotten that much, you don't need to check anything else. And the data that you need, so you need the homotopy groups, pi zero, pi one, and pi two. Those are the ones that are uh, going to be non-zero. You need to check that the rest of them are zero. So all the negative homotopy groups and all the homotopy groups above dimension two. And you don't need to know about all of the K invariants. You just need to know about the K invariant K zero. And then, so that was like the bottom map in my, so this was my Posnikov tower. This one uh, was K zero. And then this one was K1. And you don't even actually need to know what K1 is. You just need to know what the composite I1 K1 is. And if those things are correct, then you found yourself the two truncation of the sphere. Um, the, the rest of it just sort of has to fall, fall into place. So. Later on, I'm going to want to identify something as the two truncation of the sphere. That was one of my kind of pieces in this kind of coherence theorem for Picard categories that I want to generalize to dimension two. And these are the things that, um, that we can check. OK, so uh, let's talk about k invariance in the, in the world of Picard categories. So here's a, here's a theorem um, that you can go back and read, uh, you know, the, the like 50s paper of Eilenberg and McLean where they, where they determine uh, spaces with, with two consecutive non-zero homotopy groups in the stable range by some purely algebraic information. Um, and translated into the world of Picard categories, that says that a Picard category P is determined up to equivalence by pi zero, so the group of isomorphism classes of objects, pi one, the automorphisms of the unit object, and then one group homomorphism, which I will write as K zero, because it will be the thing that instantiates the, the K zero um, Posnikov invariant. And K0 goes from pi 0 tensor Z mod 2 to pi 1. And it takes um, an, an isomorphism class of objects x in, uh, in pi 0 and gives you back um, this like beta of x comma x inverse. So that's the symmetry. So here we've got an x and an x inverse. And this should, this should remind you of the picture that I drew earlier. Um, but this, of course, needs to be uh, an automorphism of the unit object. So we just, just sort of tap that off at both ends, because x tensor x inverse is isomorphic to the unit, and x inverse tensor x is isomorphic to the unit. And I'm, uh, you have to be careful that you, you pick these uh, compatibly, which is you need to make sure that x and x inverse are um, are dual to each other in this in this monoidal category using these maps. Um, and this was actually this this picture right here was the reason that I even started working on this in the first place because um, I, I could not convince myself that I knew whether or not this map had to always be the identity or not. Um, 
And I, I later, you know, found the topological literature and learned that it didn't have to be the identity and it could be quite interesting. Um, but once I knew what happened on this map, then uh, this K0 uh, tells you this, this theorem says that you, you get to know everything about the, um, the equivalence type of your Picard category. Okay, so um, the, the Picard category that I wrote is S less than or equal to one. This is the, the free one generated by a single object has pi zero being Z, and then you can compute that it has pi one uh, being Z mod two. And the, the map K zero is just the isomorphism between, between Z tensor Z mod two and Z mod two. Um, similarly, if you take the symmetric monoidal category of graded abelian groups and look at all the invertible stuff in there, uh, then you can compute the homotopy groups and K0. And this K0 map is going to be the sign rule um, that, we've, that we've chosen for the, for the graded symmetry. Um, and, and so that, that by the theorem, then you, you know that those are equivalent. Um, an interesting part of this is that if K0 is the zero map, then uh, your P actually splits as a product of the, of the object part and the morphism part. So um, any abelian group gives you a Picard category discreetly, and it also gives you a one object Picard category. Um, and so you can take products of those things and up to equivalence products of those are exactly the, the Picard categories where K0 is the zero map. Um, this is the case for this Tor example that I mentioned, but did not in any way write down. So um, what about if we think, what, what can we say about the K invariance in the case of Picard two categories instead? So this is where uh, we did some work with Mark Stefan. I think this, this might be the only kind of thing in this talk where I, I referenced that paper specifically, um, but there's a lot of good stuff in there. So if P is a Picard two category, um, and zero is its unit object, then I can make two different Picard one categories out of it. I can truncate it, that's this tau of P, by taking isomorphism classes of one cells. And I can also look at the, um, the like automorphisms of the unit, and that's this P zero comma zero. So that's the, the one cells from zero to zero and all the two cells between them. Both of those are Picard categories. Um, so it turns out that K0 uh, for P, the, the two-dimensional version, is the same as K0 for tau of P. So um, if you want to know what your K0 is for a Picard 2 category, you might as well truncate it and figure out what K0 is for that truncated version. The K0 doesn't know about anything above dimension 1. If you take this HOM, Picard category, that's P00. If you look at its K0, then that's the thing that's this K1I1 that I wrote before, this composite, which isn't quite the, um, the K1 that would tell you everything about attaching the next homotopy group, but it does tell you about attaching kind of part of it. So if you want to compute K1I1, then you can instead uh, take this HOM Picard category and compute its K0. And then finally, um, a, a really shocking thing that came out of this work with Mark is that we proved that if P is, uh, is sort of as strict as you can make it as a symmetric monoidal category and it's skeletal on objects, so any two objects that are isomorphic are in fact equal, um, then it's necessarily the case that K1I1 is equal to zero. Um, this is not true for Picard one categories and is a good indicator of why making things, sort of making Picard two categories was proving quite challenging for a lot of people um, because it means that you, you, can't, you can't have your Picard two categories be skeletal at this object level. You need to build in kind of lots of uh, extra objects to, to fatten up the space to build in the appropriate one and two cells. In particular, 
um, the two truncation of the sphere does not have k1 i1 equals zero. Um, it has k1 i1 being the identity map from z mod 2 to z mod 2. And so that means if we want to make a two truncation of the sphere spectrum, um, we've, we've got to not just try to build it by hand, which is what everybody has sort of been trying to do, um, where they had just taken you know, the objects to be integers. And then the symmetric monoidal structure just is, is sort of a, a mirror of the usual algebra on integers. That's not going to work because we need, we need to know that 2 and 1 plus 1 are equivalent but not equal. OK, so um, let, me, let me try to say something about generalizing our results uh, or this like coherence theorem to a two-dimensional version. So we have to start by, by making some structures on Picard categories. And there's um, a theorem which was uh, sort of in a paper of Highland and Power, but without very many details. It's sort of in a preprint by Schmidt, but not in the form that I really wanted. Uh, is also in a paper of John Burke's. Um, maybe not quite in the way that I would necessarily want here, but I think that one's the one that's most uh, fully fleshed out, which is that the two category of Picard categories admits the structure of a symmetric monoidal two category. Um, the the monoidal structure here, which I'm going to write like as a as a um, a smash product, so P smash Q. Um, this is this is like a generalization of the um, the tensor product of abelian groups, and in particular, the objects of this thing look like the sort of formal sums that you would see in the tensor product of two abelian groups. Um, and so the theorem that we we want to to prove uh, has these has these two parts. So first is that if we take a graded version, and by graded here I do mean z graded, um, so graded Picard categories, we wanted to make that a symmetric monoidal two category. And then we wanted to prove that if you took the invertible stuff inside of that, that would get you the two truncation of the sphere spectrum. So this was the uh, this was kind of our, our goal in setting up this, um, this machinery. Now, in order to prove this, uh, we have to do three things. We have to make a symmetric monoidal structure. We have to compute the homotopy groups. And then we have to compute at least the parts of the K invariance that I told you we needed. So we need K0 and we need K1I1. So I want to talk about those, um, those three things for the, for the rest of the talk. So how do we get? Uh, the homotopy groups. So the first thing is we got to start with pi zero. And we actually need to back up out of the graded case um, and think about just ordinary Picard categories. And we want to compute fundamentally the Picard group, in other words, the, the group of invertible Picard categories under this, uh, this sort of smash product of Picard categories. And the theorem that we proved is that every invertible Picard category is equivalent to uh, this s less than or equal to 1, which is the unit in this monoidal structure. So this is how um, the proof goes. This is quite a bit longer than I was expecting it to be, um, the proof. So the first thing you do is you say, well, if I've got a p and a q, and p smash q is equivalent to the unit, then everything has to have um, pi zero being isomorphic to the integers. This is fundamentally uh, the fact that we've got a functor pi zero from Picard categories to abelian groups. And this functor is monoidal. So um, if, you do, if you take pi zero of p smash q, that's isomorphic to pi zero of p tensor pi zero of q. And if uh, a tensor b is isomorphic to z, then uh, this is the classical computation of the Picard group of the integers. So each of, each of those things has to be isomorphic to z. So this is step one. We've identified pi zero. Step two, um, if it's the case that uh, 
P smash Q is equivalent to S less than or equal to one, then um, the, the K zero maps for P and Q. So remember that these are maps from, so K zero of P goes from I zero of P tensor Z mod two into I one of P. Um, these maps have to be injective. They can't have any uh, any kernel. Um, if if they do, then you can like split off some kind of bad pieces and uh, and prove that there's no way they can be invertible. So this is step two. You prove that these these maps have to be injective. Step three. Now we're going to take uh, a p and a q that where we use the things we've learned in parts one and two. So we know that. Uh, pi zero is Z, and we know that the, the K invariants K zero are both injective. So if that's the case, then we can compute pi one of P smash Q as um, A direct sum B, this, these are just uh, the, the ordinary direct sum of abelian groups. So A here is pi one of P. and B is pi one of Q. So you take your pi ones for your two things, you take their direct sum, and then you quotient by uh, the, the subgroup generated by the image of K zero of P minus K zero of Q. This is the same as just taking uh, the following push out. So, pi one of P smash Q has to, has to be the push out of these things. So this is the third step. And then finally, uh, the fourth step is that if, you, if your answer is going to be Z mod two in that push out, then uh, A and B have to already be Z mod twos. So um, this is just a little, a little ordinary um, algebra of abelian groups computation. Um, if you go, if you go back to this square, and you, and you assume that this, here, let's, if you assume that that is Z mod two, then uh, A and B also have to be Z mod two. And moreover, not only does the A and B have to be Z mod two, but then um, to get the correct maps, you must have that the, the map from Z mod two to A is the identity and the map from Z mod two is also uh, the identity or the isomorphism. Um, and so that gives you not only what pi one is, but also the, uh, the correct K invariant. So this is just the proof that every invertible Picard category is equivalent to the unit object. In other words, there's only one uh, equivalence class of invertible Picard categories. How do we use that to understand this um, pick of graded Picard categories? Well, the, the graded smash product of, of graded Picard categories works just like the graded tensor product of graded abelian groups. You get a big uh, co-product, which is like a direct sum of the of the of xi smash yj, where i plus j is equal to n, um, and this tells you by the sort of same argument that you would use if you wanted to compute the um, the Picard group of the category of just graded abelian groups that any invertible of uh, graded uh, Picard category has to be equivalent to to just a copy of s less than or equal to one concentrated in a single degree. So that means that pi zero of this is Z and the Z here is what degree this copy of S less than or equal to one is sitting in. Now the higher homotopy groups are gonna be given by the automorphisms of uh, this S less than or equal to one. And it's easy to compute that the, uh, the Picard category of those has a, a a pi zero, which is Z mod two, and then a pi one, which is also Z mod two, and 
the, the K invariant is the isomorphism from Z mod two tensor Z mod two to Z mod two. And what this tells us is that we've we've almost computed um, the all the k invariants that we want. What we've done is this is uh, this is k zero of uh, like ger pick cat say zero zero like the unit object, which is to say that computes k one i one, um, but we have to give a symmetry on the category of graded Picard categories. And that symmetry, remember, we can just compute it by truncating. So it's going to be the symmetry that we that we had for um, basically for, for graded abelian groups, which is this Kazool sign rule. So now we've like finally gotten back our uh, our sign rule. Except that while this has the same formula, uh, this is this is fundamentally more complicated because really I need you to read this formula where the minus one is attached to the B. If you want to try to do the symmetry twice, then the minus one that's attached to the B now goes back in the sort of second uh, second part second tensor factor, and then you'll have a minus one on the A's. And you need to know, is that the same? So that's this comparison between the thing I've shown on the right, A tensor B, and then minus A tensor minus B. Or you're going to need to know that minus A tensor B is, is the same as A tensor minus B. And so these things that I've uh, said we need to compare, they are isomorphic, but there's not a unique isomorphism between them because the isomorphism between them is sort of either like a plus one or a minus one. And remember, minus one is a, is a map. Plus one is also a map. Uh, and it doesn't mean equality here because these objects are not literally the same object, but they are isomorphic. So saying that the plus one map is the identity doesn't that doesn't make any sense. And so choosing these signs is really the kind of next step up in this in this sign rule um, story. So I want to end with a few questions, which will also maybe give you a flavor for what some of these formulas look like. Um, so one thing you can try to do, which I did for a little bit and then gave up, and maybe I should find a graduate student that wants to work on this, um, is that if you want to compute the symmetry for, um, for graded modules, you can instead do this the whole symmetric monoidal structure on chain complexes. And that has a unique symmetry. Um, and it gives you the correct one on, on graded modules. Uh, can you do that here? I, I just don't even know the answer. Um, it seems like there should be something quite interesting to say. But these categorified chain complexes are, uh, are pretty complicated things. So I, I just don't know. Um, we did find some formulas that give you the symmetric monoidal structure. And so um, if, uh, if A and B have degrees I and J, we found some formulas that worked that had, that had things like this in it. So minus one raised to the power I times J choose two. Um, and I can, I can like, find some pictures where it's pretty clear like why we why we picked that power of minus one. Um, but I don't think I, I have a, um, a particularly convincing argument for what that exponent is really supposed to mean in this case. Furthermore, um, that number, if I think of minus one to this exponent is a number, um, like the the exponent itself doesn't need to be a unique integer. Um, first of all, it could be just it could just be unique mod two. Like that's all I really care about. Um, but also, uh, really, the thing that you're interested in is the resulting symmetric monoidal structure on graded Picard categories. But this this result that um, tells you when you found the two truncation of the sphere spectrum, um, it, 
it tells you that if you know you went away and found a different a different expression for those exponents um, that still gave a symmetric monoidal structure, so this is the this is the thing that's hard to check. Um, that that would still be equivalent to the two truncation of the sphere spectrum. Um, but you know what does that say? Does it say something interesting at a kind of um, almost combinatorial level? Does it say something interesting at a topological level? I, I don't really know um, kind of at all what that might say, only that we found, I think, exactly one uh, formula that we could make work, but that doesn't mean um, that there aren't other ones or even better ones. That's all I wanted to say. Uh, thank you very much once again for the invitation, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Yeah, thank you very much, Nick. It was a great talk. Thank you. Very welcome. Uh, well, are there any questions or comments for Nick? Uh, you can raise your hand and, well, Carlos has a question, so maybe you can go ahead. Okay. Uh, uh, Nick, um, I have a question. What's happened, for example, uh, if you take cover this category? So this is a symmetric uh, monoidal category. But suppose you you uh, you are interested in the case where you have a, a G equivalent inversion in the sense that the objects are provided with principal G bundles over circle, and the the bordings, uh, the coverings are principal G bundles up to bordings. Uh, identification there. Yeah. What happened in that case? So it, it is possible to give a description of the fundamental group of the classifying space of the of the coverage category, and also for the, for example, if we are interested in the higher homotopy group. Yeah. Okay. So there, there, are, there are a lot of interesting uh, things I can I can say there. So um, one thing is um, that it's. I think very important to keep in mind that uh, that the the way that like information is encoded here is um, is sort of fundamentally different from what you would get if you're thinking about these things through the lens of the cobordism hypothesis. So the cobordism hypothesis says that uh, that the cobordism category is, you know, the free, uh, say, infinity one category on a fully dualizable object. Um, so it's it's important, I think, to um, to like think about how you're going from from that version to like what I'm thinking of here, because so this is the this is the kind of difference between um, thinking about these stable homotopy n types, which truncate and and like cut everything off after after some point, and um, thinking about spectra in general, because if you uh, if you cut everything off um, by by doing like an identification, then um, what happened? I think I think a lot of stuff collapses. It's been a long time since I've thought about this, but um, a kind of like related phenomenon is the uh, is the question about like how should you define equivalences versus adjunctions um, internally to um, to say infinity categories, and if you if you're doing things from a kind of purely algebraic point of view, where you where you like build build up at each level, um, then uh, if you if you never kind of like enforce an axiom, like a triangle identity sort of axiom at some point, um, then then equivalence and adjunction the definitions basically just look the same because they're kind of these recursive definitions that both say there exists some things in the next dimension up that that want to compare some composite and some other composite. And so that's exactly what's going on in the cobordism category. You can, like, when you draw a picture of a cobordism, um, you've sort of drawn the, the 
dual part, um, which is to say the adjunction part. And you don't want to treat that as an invertible thing. So I think this is just a, a long-winded way of saying that um, even though the the invertible things and the dualizable things like are very, very, very closely related. Um, somehow it seems very hard to kind of transfer some meaningful information from one to the other. Um, as for doing some like more complicated uh, cobordisms with some bundles, I. I just don't know off the top of my head. Um, I think it's a, an interesting question. Um, I mean, maybe it's worth saying that, um, that this kind of theory is not very good at like taking a topological structure that you don't understand, converting it into a categorical structure, learning a new thing and then going back. Um, it's much better at taking a topological structure that you do understand and using it to explain a categorical structure that you don't understand, or um, a, you know, a thing that we found repeatedly is you come up with a question about you know symmetric monoidal two categories or symmetric monoidal three categories or something like that um, that you don't know the answer to, uh, then this kind of theory is often good at helping you find a, um, a spectrum that when you, when you move it back into the world of Picard two categories or, or Picard three categories, um, sort of tells you that, you know, the answer to whatever your first original question was is obviously not the answer that you wanted. So it's, it's very good at telling you that things are more complicated than, um, than you want them to be and not very good at actually doing the computation for you. I don't know if that, I think it probably doesn't help you, but maybe it helps you know that, yeah, like I said, it's not gonna do the comp. But uh, suppose that I know how works the uh, localization of the category of fraction. So mm -hmm. it helps you maybe to understand this uh, uh, yeah, I could, I could see that. Um, I don't think I've thought about that kind of situation before, but I could imagine um, that maybe, yeah, you, if you understand like how, like what that's supposed to be. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Be because, well, uh, I can say you some, uh, some work. Yeah. yeah. Because of these things that you say that all, all the search are collapse. Yeah. For example, in this, uh, in dimension two, uh, we can see this, like you are cutting along trivial monogamy in all the color distance. So mm -hmm. and then everything collapses to the um, uh, two-dimensional free for this group of common So Yeah, yeah. You, should, yeah you should send me something. I mean, I, then maybe it does sound like this could, this could maybe um, tell you something a bit interesting. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much, Carlos, for the question. Are there any other questions or comments? Uh, well, it seems that, uh, yeah, please go ahead. Uh, 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 there, was, there was something like a safer Van Kampen uh, result. Um, so, yeah, I think that like, was the Pi one. Yeah, pi this one. this like this like pi oh, one. Yeah. yeah, sort of computation here. Yes. Yeah. So, if yeah. uh, um, so, uh, is this just so? My question is, why do you have Sita tensor uh, set mod two? Ah, so this is um, this is going back to uh, this um, this way of writing our um, our Picard categories. So the K zero um, these these everything every time that there's like 
an A tensor zero, Z mod two to, to B. In that case, A is the pi zero of your Picard category and the B is the pi one and this map is K zero. So it just turns out that uh, that this, this K zero just tries to like force everything to be um, two torsion along the way. Um, so if you, if you, oh, I should have, I should have, uh, so if you look at this, um, this picture of what K zero of X is, um, then you can, you can compute using, oh, I should have, I should have thought about this. Sometimes I'm prepared. So you can think about what happens if you put two of these next to each other. It doesn't matter if you put them next to each other or uh, um, you, could, you can try to compose them, but uh, they, they sort of don't cancel in the way that you want. Um, so let me, I think I'm not gonna be able to do the calculation uh, the second, but you can compute that this is, um, this is the identity map. Uh, if you want, if you want to send me an email, and I can like do it on a piece of paper for you, okay. um, mm -hmm. this is this is this is easy to do. Yeah. Um, so, like I said, this goes back to uh, to this Eilenberg McLean paper from like is it like 1951 or something, um, where they where they classify. So they they didn't have this kind of language, but they said, okay, well, what if we have a space and it only has two non-zero homotopy groups. And those two homotopy groups appear in like significantly high dimension. Then, you know, what do you need to know to know exactly what your space is? So you could take, um, you know, the easy answer is like, you can take an two, two Eilenberg McLean spaces. Like you can, if you've got A, your group pi i is a in your group pi i plus one is b. You can take a k a i and a k b i plus one and take the product of those two things. And it has the right homotopy groups of the space you're interested in, but it's probably not the right space because most likely your homotopy groups are sort of entangled with one another. Um, so you need to know something else. And that something else is just one single k invariant. Uh, going back to like our, our K invariant picture. Um, and and they, they computed that what you needed was a, a homomorphism like this. This is not exactly uh, the way that they originally wrote it down, but this is this is equivalent to, um, to that. That paper, I think is very hard to read, um, like most papers from 1951. From yeah. but, but I think it's also, sort of like just sufficiently complicated mathematics and they did a lot all in one place that yeah all those things combined to make a difficult to read sort of account um, with not very modern language but um fundamentally the fact that there's a z mod 2 goes back to their calculations okay mm -hmm. like i said if you want to do this calculation this specific one uh send me an email and i will uh it's because you wouldn't take it, a picture. Okay, yeah, because it's an. It seems like uh, you're asking it. Like, I'm trying to relate this to the topological part of my mind, and it seems like asking the p zero to be set is like asking it to be like um one a uh, connected component. Um. um yeah, so so here, like the pi zero in you know in all the calculations that we ended up later, we always ended up with like a pi zero is is z um, or maybe a z mod two, um, depending on which things. So so that means you're just getting a homomorphism from you know z mod two into pi one, which is which is just picking out some some element of two torsion in pi one. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much for the question, Luis. Uh, maybe, so it's 2.15, uh, so maybe Nick has has to go, sadly. I have, I have to, if, there's, if there's like one last question, I could answer that. Um, well, are there any other questions? 
Well, I do, I do have a quick question. So I thought about emailing you a couple questions, but maybe this is better in person. <laughs> So what's the so basically well you so you did a very 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 beautiful job in explaining this so sort of once you know that you want to prove that you want to compute the the two spectrum the Picard version of the two spectrum of the sphere as the pick of the two category of uh, graded Picard categories then you okay well all the computations are good but what, what's the intuition behind picking that as your uh, option for so, yeah, so I think um, the the intuition for me is something like um, I want to try to to push this um, push this analogy that uh, that the like the truncated sphere spectrum gives you the same algebra as like graded something or others. Yeah. And, and then I need to pick what the correct something or other is and, and then do the computation. Um, okay. So at some level, you know, you could, you could pick uh, probably lots of things, um, but then, yeah, you need to go through and, and understand what the invertible things are and then what the, uh, what the automorphisms of those things are. Um, okay. I should say that there's a, there's a, I think like a clear, I don't want to call it problem, but like there needs to be a real thought moving from dimension two to dimension three, because um, at the, at dimension two, uh, the, so every spectrum also has a Picard, every ring spectrum also has a Picard spectrum, um, which is like, sort of like the Picard group of yeah, a yeah. ring, except it's all spectra now. Um, yeah. and, and so for the sphere spectrum, these start off the same, but they start to diverge. Um, and they diverge at three, or maybe there's a shift and it's two. I don't, I'm not going to remember off the top of my head, but, um, but it's, it's right at this point. Um, so uh, I think that means that you you do need to put in something like a bit more complicated um, because, you know, the, the, the sort of two category of Picard categories is fundamentally just like modules over the unit Picard category. Um, but, but going, going up to the, the sort of Picard three category case, if you want to find the three truncation of the sphere in there, I think um, doing the same thing uh, just just like clearly doesn't work, um, and and this is this is essentially the same question as um, the the third stable homotopy group of the sphere spectrum is a Z mod twenty four. <laughs> like, find me a twenty four um, anywhere. In, yeah. in sort of a natural construction of, of higher categories, and uh, and I and I don't know how to do that. Um, <laughs> so it's a, a very interesting question, but I think it's kind of one that has to has to sort of just live in the background for a while, and then at some point somebody's probably going to find a, a, okay. a nice way to get this twenty four. Um, but I've I've had lots of things to sort of uh, manufacture torsion of various degrees as outputs for constructions on Picard, say, two categories, um, and even getting some three torsion, much less 24 torsion, uh, even getting three torsion, um, I was unsuccessful to do in a kind of very hands-on way. So okay. it's a hard question to answer. OK, OK. OK, well, thank you very much. Thank you very much yeah. for the answer, and thank you very much for for the talk and, and for taking your time to answer yeah. all the questions. <laughs>